BDSM, fetish, and probably alternative non-normative sexual communities. Um, so that means that possibly some of the images that you will see are sexually explicit. I'm not going to like dwell on that or try to post pornography on your screen. Um, but if you do have kids walking by or coworkers walking by, just be aware that there might be something like that um, as I show you the collections. Um, so we are about 10,000 square feet, just to give you an idea of um, like how big of a space and how big the collections are. If the building is 10,000 square feet. The collections like library and archive storage is about a quarter of that. I want to say like 2,500 square feet, if that gives you an idea. I don't really have measurements um, that are updated beyond that. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, sort of what the collections management systems were when I got here and what my process was to move them into what they are now. Um, so I use collective access as my primary collections management system, like WBUZ, and I know a few other archives in Chicago do. Um, it is an open source, um, free to use, free to develop, and customized system. Um, so it was perfect for us, me having zero budget for to develop the system or to get support for it. Um, I was able to get a grant from Ishrab um, for about 3600 um, for a year to work on developing the system. And I was able to hire an assistant um, project archivist, Michelle Dino, who is incredible, who helped me for a year to migrate all of our data, which I'll talk about um, the difficulties of that a little bit. So I'm going to, and also um, feel free to like interrupt in the chat with um, questions and, um, and I'll, um, respond as we go if needed. I'm gonna to try to share my screen again. And hopefully, okay, does this work for everybody? Can you see multiple yes. windows? Yes, we see it. Great. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna show you like some of, just to start with like what our former systems were for describing and sharing information about our collections. So first we had, um, finding aids, which were encoded in EAD. Um, and then they were, um, I'm, I can't remember the name of the program. It's like a really old EAD writing um, notepad like program um, that exports your EAD to HTML um, to put on your website. Um, I'm pretty sure that the actual program to edit these documents has not been developed or updated since the 90s or 2000s. Um, and you can kind of tell like this is what it exports as an HTML finding aid document. So these were on our website um, and that was how the archives were described and then how the finding aids were shared. Um, and then Separately, totally separately from that, we had a library um, catalog using Evolve, um, which just looks like a typical um, library search results. That was a completely separate website. Um, we had a third system in use using an access database. So the access database um, was all of the item records broadly. Um, so all of the artifacts, um, like you can see, these are t-shirt records that I'm scrolling through. Um, you can see this is not Dublin core based, um, really basic. Like this is the full record for an item, just what you see. Um, and this is the results of a search um, that I looked up for just the color blue. Um, it, is not a sophisticated database. It's literally just a single um, like keyword search that searches across all of these flat item records. It's not a very relational database and I'll show you the um, structure of it. Can you see this um, map of the database, this image of it? Yes. So um, it was really only two tables. Uh, a resources table, which is the item records, um, and an acquisitions table, which was most of the accession records. Um, not everything got an accession record, um, 
but the ones that like were recorded in the database were in this separate table. Um, and then there is this totally separate isolated little table museum objects, which was an older database, which was just like a single table, like a spreadsheet of an inventory of items that was then put into this database, but not integrated with the other item records. So it was like a spreadsheet in a database um, with some other like isolated tables that were used for um, like workflow purposes. Like it seems like um, it seems like volunteers would like enter in the temporary description into one table and then it would be manually moved or added to the main table after it was reviewed. Um, I, it's kind of unclear to me what the process was with some of this, as you can probably tell with me trying to describe it. Um, I didn't build this database and um, there wasn't very much like information or documentation about it. So I just had like the actual data to go by to try to figure out what it was, how it was used. Um, luckily it wasn't too complicated. It's just Dublin core records and um, even though it is a database, it's not very relational. Like it exports just as a single table, um, which I will show you because it's pretty interesting. So this is what it exports as. Um, it's a, uh, you've got your metadata element, um, the content of it, and then the ID number that it's attached to the item ID number. Um, so yeah, it, like this is it. It's just, and this is totally unsorted. This is what I exported. And this is the data I had to work with. Um, so that was our main database, both for items, um, all artifacts were in here, um, but also for a lot of files. So a lot of photograph files were cataloged as items in this database, um, as well as other like aggregate aggregate objects, so to speak. Um, a lot of audiovisual media was in here. Um, some of that was also in the library database. Some of it was duplicated across the library database and this access database. This access database did not talk to or it was not integrated with, um, with the finding aids. So I had the problem of, I would have a collection um, like uh, Michelle Buchanan's collection of papers, but all the artifacts from her collection would have like process wise been separated from the archival collection and they would have been input into the database as unique, totally separate items with no metadata or other like formal connection to the archival finding aid. So I had these like totally separate systems that weren't talking to each other. I had to figure out what to do with all of this data. So only the finding aids and the library database were available online. Um, the artifact records were not, this was just an internal database. So I um, determined that we would- no, Can we ask a quick question about your access database right here? Yeah, sure. Um, so is it that the image that's displayed up here when you were going through, is it the same this guy? Um, item that it that all of those records are attached to, or is it just like a placeholder image? That is a placeholder image. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there used to be like little thumbnails for each image, for each item. I mean, um, would have its own image, but that is broken. Like the links to those images, and I never managed to fix it. Gotcha. And since I don't use this anymore, I don't need to. Oh, of course, sure. Thank um, you. But yeah, that's just a placeholder. Um, so yes, um, moving forward, um, I decided to use collective access, um, for a few reasons. Number one, um, let me stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, okay, number one, uh, I had used it before. Um, I think this is kind of like an underrated um, very practical <laughs> reason, which is that I was familiar with it and I knew that it would work for this scenario. Um, and I think that's a perfectly okay reason. Um, I did spend some time looking for other systems, but I did not 
find one that was open source and that was flexible enough for what I wanted it to do. Um, so I knew that I could work with it. I, it was flexible. I could not find anything else that was quite right. So that's why I decided to go with. Um, so it is open source. You can pay for hosting from WhirlyGig, who is the company that develops it. You can pay for hosting, um, development, um, anything else that you need from them. Um, but they have a very active forum. Um, of people answering and asking questions about the system and the developers are very responsive there so i actually had no problem um, just getting answers from the forum either asking questions or just searching the forum for people who had the same question that i did about how to do something um, so that was a really great resource um, it has a great wiki of documentation. It's not perfect, um, but it is way better than it is way more thorough and um, has way more information than a lot of other like open source systems, wikis and documentation that I am aware of um, and that I've used before. So um, I mostly just rely on the forum and the wiki. I did not pay for development or any other kind of support. Um, so collective access, it's um, I'm not a web developer um, of any sort or administrator, um, but I just kind of learned by doing. Um, so it's written in PHP. I did have to learn some PHP, not so much how to like write in PHP, but definitely how to edit it and how to read it um, so that I could um, change the appearance and displays of the system as needed. Um, so you, Customize your system with an XML profile. That's the other thing. Um, a lot of us are very familiar with XML in various formats. Um, I need to share my screen again to show you. But um, so if you customize it in an XML profile, which I will show you shortly, and then the database is MySQL. So those are kind of the basics of the system that you either need to know or like be able to get familiar with to make it work for you is PHP, the basic fact that it's web-based um, and that you're running a website, you're developing a website. Um, it's not just a program that you install and run. Um, so basic like web management, PHP, the XML profile, and then being able to interact with the MySQL database. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again with you. Um, this is the XML profile, um, just to show you what it looks like. Um, not that you'll like be able, this is a lot of information to show on a screen, not that you'll be able to like read and understand the structure just by looking at a piece of it. Um, but it is pretty straightforward ultimately. Um, so everything in the system can be almost, almost everything can be customized in this XML profile before you even install the system. Um, and configure it. So object types is one of the first things in this profile that I have. Um, I tell it specifically, what are my object types? Images, artworks, artifacts, moving images, text, sound recordings, publications. Um, so an object, this, the implication of this is an object can be anything in collective access. Like an object can be um, the typical objects that archives and museums and libraries collect. Um, and those standard types, um, but it can be anything. An object can be a dream, like you could use this to catalog dreams. An object can be like rocks. It can, you can tell it any kinds of objects that you would like to catalog. It does not matter. The system does not care. Um, and they can be hierarchical. These are not incidentally, but you can have hierarchical kind of like nesting types. Um, same thing for everything else. Entity types, I have individuals and organizations place types, which I'll talk more about later. Um, but yeah, that is how you configure it, is in XML. You can do it via, like you can just install a basic XML profile. One that just comes with the system, there are a couple options based on, like there's a basic Dublin Core profile. There's a, I believe there's a basic DAX profile um, that is just kind of like intended to be used out of the box for DAX cataloging. Um, and then if you don't like any part of it, you can go in 
to the listen vocabularies side to change or add controlled vocabularies or the administration side to edit any of your metadata elements um, to add new ones um, to change their restrictions to change their names um, etc um, I chose to fully customize it starting with the XML profile because of the complexity of the data I had to deal with um, and just because it uh, made more sense to me conceptually to make the make all the decisions to start with of how the system would be structured instead of having to go in individually afterwards and like try to keep track in the user interface of everything that I would be changing um, but you can definitely just install a basic profile and then go in and customize through the UI without even touching the XML um, and that is very doable. <clears throat> So this is, the, this is the back end of the system, basically the cataloging user interface. Um, if you're in the other session, you saw this before, very basic, um, very usable. And then this is the front end, which I believe WBZ does not use. So you have the like, cataloging interface and then you have a, like a public presentation um, website. They're just two different websites that are built on the same database. And the public side is what most people see. Um, so uh, as for other reasons why you might choose collective access, um, number one, is like an object can be anything, a collection can be anything, an entity can be anything. Those are just like very vague concepts and you can implement them however you want. Um, so like if I go to an archival collection, um, let me just find an event record. Okay, so this is an event record. So when I say like it was as it was flexible and I couldn't find anything else as flexible, what I mean is I didn't just want to catalog objects and collections. I wanted to be able to catalog um, conceptual things. So I wanted to be able to catalog events. Um, so in uh, leather communities, um, in kink communities, the communities are very organized around annual and recurring events, um, leather contests, conventions, um, just like hundreds across the country. And I wanted event to be a concept in my database that I could describe, that I could attach records to, that I could have full metadata for, um, just like I would an object. So collective access enabled me to do that. They have this table, this concept of occurrences. So you have object tables. You have the object table that you have entities, collections, storage locations. You also have occurrences, which can be anything. So I renamed occurrences events. Um, an occurrence is like any concept that you want to be able to create metadata and full records for. Um, I can't really think of another example of like what it could be um, shows, like exhibits could be something that you catalog in your database using this occurrences table. Um, and then places. So, and it's been a while since I like did a lot of research on other collections management systems um, because I've been using this one for about two years now. Um, but I found that um, there were a lot of limitations on uh, metadata of place. So there are systems where like you can add a location to a record as like a subject term or something like that, but that's it. It's just a term. It's just a controlled vocabulary, like a list of places. But I wanted to be able to have a hierarchy of places. 
Um, and I want us to be able to describe places like I do objects. Um, and I'll show you why. Um, so I have this hierarchy, which you can see. We're on the Chicago page. I can go up to the Illinois page, see like the children of it, um, all the organizations in my database that are based in Illinois or under it, all the events that are statewide or under it. Um, if I go down a level to its child Chicago, same deal, Chicago includes all of these locations. Um, a lot of them are bars, um, all these organizations which are Chicago based, the events which are Chicago based. So if I go to a child, um, child bar, so a bar under Chicago, um, I can have a full record describing that place, like that historical location, when it existed, the description of it, its organizational history, if I want to write that out, its address, I can link it to anything. I can link it to its related events that took place there, all the objects that have to do with that place. So you can see it's just like a much more robust system um, for like location-based cataloging than just having a subject term that is Chicago um, that I just link to a record. Um, so I really needed that. Um, I really wanted to be able to do that um in our system uh there is a another way to catalog places as metadata in here which i do not use so like there's this where places are full records which you can link to other records um there's two other ways to do it geocode and georeference i think um which are like the latitude longitude which you would use if you wanted to actually produce a map, like a Google map showing um, places with points on the map um, and like a visualization system um, where you can like put a geo reference, a latitude longitude on a record and then that'll appear on a map and a visualization. There's a way to do that. Um, that is one of the parts of the, like one of the options in the system that is not very well documented so overall, the documentation is really great um, for everything that I wanted to do. Um, when it came to, I tried to do with do the maps because I thought kind of having a visualization um, of like the locations of all of these historic Chicago bars would be pretty awesome. Um, so like be able to visualize that on a map to put a geo reference on them. But I couldn't figure it out. Um, I think I would have to develop and encode more than like beyond my abilities in order to implement that. Um, and I didn't find very good documentation or like many people using that um, who could explain it or had explained it already in the forums. So I chose not to do that. Um, so one of the downsides um, of collective access, which is why I don't always necessarily recommend it, is because of all these decisions you have to make because it is so flexible and customizable that you have to choose everything. Like you have to choose like, what standard am I gonna use? How am I gonna implement it? Um, what are my object types? <laughs> like, what is my place structure? Am I gonna use places or am I gonna use like as records or am I gonna use geo references as subject terms? Um, like you just kind of have to decide everything of how you want it to work and how you want it to appear in the system down to like, um, like if I go back to a record, um, down to like the order that these appear on this editing form, the order that they appear was decided by me. Like I had to tell it these, like this is the order in which I want these metadata items to appear on this form. And this is um, like, I want this one to appear closed. So I have to open it if I wanna add something and I want this to always appear open. So it's always there and I can always just directly enter. Like there's, you have so much control over the system's appearance, um, the actual metadata, um, what happens when I roll over, what it says. <laughs> Um, the kind of information I can put in there, the 
data standard um, of what I can put in there. It's, you know, there's just a decision to make about everything. So like there is, there is like an out of the box profile, um, but there's still so much customization that you have to do to make it work your workflow that if you don't have like time or interest in doing that, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this just because it would be an unnecessary amount of customization um, if ultimately your data is pretty straightforward and just fits into an out of the box um, like DAX based or Dublin Core based um, cataloging system, then I would do that. But mine was not, and I wanted to do a lot more than what those systems allowed me to do. So it works for me, but it's not necessarily ideal for everything. Um, there's definitely, definitely a time and a place for a system that is just like the standard that just works in a standard way. Um, so as for the actual migration, the hardest part was the data I had, I had to work with. Um, so I showed you before the spreadsheet where it was just like all the data mixed up with the metadata item in one column, the content, and then the ID for the record it goes to. First, we separated those out. So I pulled out all of the date entries into one spreadsheet, pulled out all of the description entries to a different spreadsheet. So we could just work on each part each metadata element at one time. So there was no content standard, um, or like, what am I trying to say? There was like no standardized way in which data was entered into the old database. So these dates have all been standardized so that they can be imported into collective access, which does have a date standard. Like there are only certain ways you can put in a date. Um, so we had to literally go through, well, Michelle, my wonderful assistant, had to literally go through and normalize all the dates so they would import. Um, a totally separate issue was the names. So in the old database, there were thousands upon thousands of names, um, donor names, subject names, creator names, and they were completely non-normalized. So for every person, I would have like, there'd be like JS Adams, and then another entry would be like John Sam Adams, and another entry would be just like, Jay Adams, another entry. It was just like every version of every name was in the database and we had to go through and normalize all of them. So one person's name appeared one way um, and we just had one record for that person um, instead of five different ways to enter their name and five different records. Um, so most of our work was actually just normalizing um, the data that I started with. Um, and then the hardest part of working with collective access for me is, was the import system. Um, importing data, I don't think I have an example of what that looks like. So I'll just show you the documentation for it. This is the wiki. Um, this is the documentation for importing data into the system. It is the worst part. It is really hard. <laughs> I can do it now um, and I'm really comfortable with it but I found it to be the glitchiest part of collective access. It's despite how thorough the documentation is, um, A, it's like so thorough, it's overwhelming. So it's just like, when I look at this, I'm just like how, like if I had to do this again, I probably would not want to um, learn all of this. And, uh, and then because the system has changed over time and been developed over time, um, some of these things just don't work like the way the wiki documentation says they do. For the most part, it does. It works the way it says it does. Um, but there are little things that just did not and they ruined my life for several months and made it very, very hard to import our data. Um, I presume that a lot of those things have changed or been fixed in the past two years. Um, and once I kind of learned how to use this and how to read this documentation, um, I didn't have a problem with it anymore, but it definitely took a good like six months of pain to get to that point. Um, so the data import process, um, if I, 
had had more funding is something that I would have wanted developer support with in particular. Um, so you can just use the back end, like WB Easy does. Um, I use both the front end and the back end. Um, I spent several months customizing the look and feel of the front end. Um, there are, uh, there's just like the out of the box way it appears, which is fine. Um, and for the most part, all collective access systems look similar. Um, you can kind of tell, like I have this other one open. This is, I think, a really great system. Um, Jacob's Pillow Dance Archives. Um, you can see they have the same basic structure because they're using collective access. They have the same basic headers. Um, they have this scrolly thing, scrolly presentation thing. Um, browse uh, periodicals. This is our browse page for periodicals. If I go to my browse objects, you're gonna see it. It's the same basic thing. The just the appearance, just the style is different. Um, so that was a really big factor in me choosing Collective Access as well. Is I really like their public interface, their presentation system. I think it's extremely accessible. It's like pretty. Um, a lot of library uh, and like archives um, public facing systems are uh, really opaque and difficult to use and um, they really like um, hide, I want to say like hide the digitized objects. Um, like I shouldn't have to open a record and then click three times to open the actual digitized image. Like the digitized image should just be present when I open the record um, and not obscured and not like hidden behind some like extra thing I have to click through to see the scan. Um, yeah, I really like just how simple and clean it is. Um, and then I love the navigation of browse. Um, so I found that a lot of other um, systems do not have very good browses. They have great searches. Um, like if I'm using a, generally using a library system, I'll use a search um, and it'll have very limited browse functions. Um, collective access is designed so that you're primarily using browse to find things. Um, I find that much more intuitive. Um, partly because um, I don't think we should assume that people know what they're looking for. Um, and browse presents all the options to you. So like I can just browse all objects and it'll give me options for like what else I might want to filter by. Um, type, the decade it's from, the collection it's in, the organization it relates to, um, the language it's in, if it's text, um, and then whether it has digital media. So I can filter just things that have digital objects and I can see them <laughs> very easily in this, which I like. Um, so I just really liked that about it. Um, Mel, just to let you know, we've got a little less than 10 minutes. Yeah. So because I know you, you have to be uh, punctual today. Yeah, no, I'm um, pretty much done. So um, okay. Yeah, I'll just add like, uh, the other like downsides I'll say is that because it's a it's a web based, um, here, I'll stop sharing. Um, because it's a web based system, um, I just have to figure out a way to host it. Uh, and I we use shared hosting right now, which really sucks. Um, there's a lot of limitations on that. I would definitely want to use a virtual private server. Um, if I were to start over or be able to migrate the system to new hosting. Um, and there are like a few bugs with it, but it's not very buggy, especially like for open source software. Uh, it's like, there really are no like major faults or bugs that have come up for me. Um, it's pretty clean. It's pretty easy to use and straightforward. Um, there are just a few things. Um, it definitely has its particularities, but like hosting has been awful. And that has nothing to do with collective access. So it just has to do with the realities of 
shared hosting. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Like that is my basic system. I I hope that was somewhat interesting. Um, I'm happy to like answer any questions. And then in the future too, if anyone ever wants to like talk about this process or like is having to go through it and like want someone to talk through with it, I am always happy to do that as well. All right, get your questions in. Thank you so much, Mel. That was really um, interesting and engaging. And I'm glad you kind of went through your process as to like why you picked that up, why you picked collective access and like what your pros and cons were. Um, you know, I found that to be pretty informative. Um, so thank you for that. That was really great. Want to put in a, a last call for questions. If nobody has any, then, um, you know, we can all thank Mel for her presentation today um, and for spending time with us. And we get to see her lovely space as well, which is not something that we always get to do uh, in these times. So, and the, the whole concept of um, cataloging events in the manner that you did in the, in the locations, that, that, that was awesome. That was great. And I think that's something that we hadn't uh, thought of. Uh, and so that garnered a little bit of chat about like how one can do that now in our own institutions. And so that was, that was a great, um, thanks for pointing that out, just the ways that you use that. Absolutely. I, um, it can be used for anything. Like it, you can catalog any concept that you want in there, not just like physical objects. Excellent. All right. Well, you're getting all sorts of kudos in the chat. Yeah. And I just want to mention um, really quickly that next week there's another event going on. So it's the subcommittee uh, info session happy hour. It's a joint event between outreach and special events and programming. So there is still time to sign up. If anybody's interested in like what we do, the co-chairs will be available to talk to. And if you're interested in joining, you know, totally, we're totally for it. We're hoping, you know, to recruit a couple more members. So if you've enjoyed this programming and have further ideas on future programming, let us know. <laughs> All right, and uh, we're trying to work through how we're gonna make these sessions available. So please be patient with us as we work through that. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. Thank you once more to Mel and I hope everyone has a safe holiday and a great rest of, rest of their week. All right, thanks so much, Mel. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, absolutely. I am happy to share stuff like this. And I've enjoyed the other ones too. It's been like, I, awesome. I find all this really interesting and um, it's really nice to even like, it's like a support group sometimes of like, oh yeah, we all have to deal with that. Okay, good. <laughs> oh yeah.